where is home? This is a question that might seem rather easy for a lot of you, but for me, it's one of the hardest questions you could ever ask me. Just by saying it, my heart started pounding, my hands started being sweaty. I just want to run away from that question. Because the truth is, I don't know where home is. I don't have an answer to this question. By speaking with people around me, I have realized that I'm not the only one in that situation. So I started looking up a bit what kind of a person I was. And it looks like there's a term that is being used to define people like me, third culture kids. Third culture kids have grown up in different places around the globe and have been raised in three different cultures. First, the cultures that they have at home from their parents. Second, the culture from the place they live in. And third, their own culture the one from all the places they have lived in and they just made a mix, and that is their third culture. Technically speaking, I am not a third culture kid because I grew up in one place for 14 years, but I do assimilate with a lot of the things they feel and the way they are. My story starts on the 19th of November, 2011. It starts in Brussels, Belgium. My mom comes home one day and it was, it was just a Wednesday afternoon, and she came home and told my sister and I that we were gonna go and have dinner at a restaurant. I was really excited because it was a school day and I could go to a restaurant and I was 13, it was the highlight of my week. I get there and I could feel like something was wrong, but I wasn't sure what. So I let my mom speak because that's usually how it goes. She's just gonna tell us anyways. She told us that she had big plans for the family. The family being my mom, my sister, and I, because my dad passed away when I was young. So I just thought maybe new holiday spot, or I don't know, I wasn't sure, so I just let her speak once again. She told us that she wanted to move away. I stayed a bit silent, I was confused, but in my head, moving away was probably from Brussels to Paris, something that I could still manage. She told us that she would think about a potential destination, and then let us know. I thought I had time, that she had it covered, and that maybe she was going to change her mind because it was one of her phases. November 21st, 2011. We're back in our favorite restaurant with the not-so-favorite conversation topic. Mom told us she had looked at different criterions and found two possible places for, for us to live. OK, just go ahead, Mom. Shoot. Option A, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Option B, Sao Paulo, Brazil. So both destinations being 11,000 kilometers away from home. This is not the Brussels, Paris that I thought it was. So I thought that once more I was going to have time to convince her to stay. But she takes out tickets uh, for her plane reservations. Brussels, Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires, Brussels, and all that for a month and a half later. Okay. End of January, mom comes back from her trip and tells us that we're going, guess where? The restaurant. Okay. She had been super quiet, so I was a bit worried. I didn't know what to think. And she takes out a stack of paper for me and a stack of paper for my sister. I looked at her, just being like, mom, cut it, tell me where we're going. She wants us to read the stack of paper. It was a letter. A letter from my mom to us explaining why we were moving and where we were moving. The destination was Buenos Aires, Argentina. I stood quiet. I didn't know what to do, but at the same time, she kept on talking to me, telling us that for Easter break, we were going to go there and try to find schools because we were definitely moving. I stayed silent the whole night. I was just, I just wanted to get home and start crying in my own room and not in front of my mom, and I just needed to process. But my brain was super confused, plenty of questions, and my heart was just heavy. What was I going to do in a country so far with people I didn't know, far from my friends, my family, 
my childhood home with all my memories of my father. I did not want to move. So Easter breaks comes and we go to Argentina and I actually liked the city as much as I didn't really want to admit it, I liked it. But I had one problem. I needed to find a school where I was gonna go. The bigger problem was that I didn't speak English or Spanish. So whenever I had interviews, I was just trying to use French words and putting them in English and it was just a total mess. But one day I went to visit a school for my sister, a British boarding school right outside of Buenos Aires. And I fell in love with the place. It's one of those places where I knew I wanted to go and I would be happy there. So I spoke to the lady of the admissions and explained to her my situation. And she told me that if I made the effort of learning a bit of English before going, I had my chances of getting into the school. I finally saw some light in all the darkness that this situation was to me. Then we went back to Belgium and it was time to tell our family and our friends when we were gonna leave. It was time to learn some English for me. It was time to pack. It was time to say goodbye. And then it was time to leave. When we got to Argentina, we faced many differences, would they be cultural or just simple daily life differences. For example, my sister and I had never used any other device than simply the peso, no, than the euro. So we get there and my mom tells us, here they use the peso. One euro equals 14 or 15 pesos. Okay, that's a lot of maths to do, but I can deal with it. But then we also brought in dollars to exchange them to the peso. On the first day, my sister wanted to do well and wanted to go and buy some fruits for us. And she comes back home really proud saying, mom, I bought six bananas. I spoke to the lady in Spanish, or that's what I think. And it went well. My mom asked her, so how much did all of that cost you? And she said, 17 pesos. My mom looks at her wallet and no pesos had been taken out. My sister had paid six bananas, $17. She learned from that mistake, yeah. <laughs> so then, when I started going to school, I got into the British boarding school, so I was really happy. But um, I soon faced a very big challenge, being the new kid in the school. I had never had that. So we had a very strict uniform, and the only way I could differentiate myself and show my identity was through my shoes, my bag, or my jewelry. So I decided to go for the shoes and the bag because I, wasn't, I didn't like jewelry that much back then. And I put my black loofers on the first day because we had to wear black shoes. And I just saw people whispering around me a lot, making me feel really uncomfortable. And it was whispers in Spanish, so I didn't understand them. And I soon enough understood that that's not the type of shoes that they would wear there. Then I came into class with my handbag but in Argentina, they had backpacks. So I understood that I was gonna have to fit in and that my identity would have to take a bit of a step back there because I needed to survive in that school and not make myself even more different than I already was. After two years in Argentina, my sister got into a university in France and she was planning to leave. I envied her so much. I too wanted to leave the house, have my own life, be independent, and so I did some research online and found a network of schools that are spread a bit across the world and that promote the idea of making education a force to unite people, nations, and cultures in order to make uh, a sustainable future and peace. That sounded like the perfect place for me. So I applied to this network of schools and was selected after a few rounds of interviews to be the Belgian representatives to the school in the kingdom of Eswatini, which back then was still Swaziland. So it's lost in the middle of South Africa, but it's beautiful. And I get there, and first of all, it's a seven hours drive from Johannesburg, and you're in the middle of nowhere, it's just the mountains. So the school is up a hill, I get up the hill and see this beautiful boarding school, 600 students, 60 different nationalities represented. I felt at ease, because I felt like I wasn't the only one who had been through different moves and most of them had been moving there themselves so they knew what I was going through. I felt less lonely. 
But in the beginning, when you have 600 students around you, you don't know who to turn to and who are going to be your friends. So logically, I tried to find the people that ticked my boxes in a way. Nationalities, any Belgians, Italians, found some. Languages I spoke, if we had a language in common, probably I was going to come and speak to you. And then different similar cultures, probably any Latin Americans, I would directly go to them. But soon enough, I realized that it wasn't with these people that I got along with the best. It was with a Norwegian, a Bangladeshi guy, a Moroccan girl, a Zimbabwean guy. It was a bit of everything, but not that much the people that ticked my boxes. I then realized that it is not what I have on paper that is who I am. Maybe at some point I was just Belgian, but at that point I had moved abroad, I had seen different cultures, making me that new mix, and I had to adapt my friendships to that. I also tried to find people who would be okay with having very fast, a very deep friendship, because I knew that I was staying for two years, I had been gone through, uh, going through that, and I didn't want to waste any time. I found that, I was really happy. Then I graduated, and I graduated in end of November, and I was coming here only in October. So I had a gap year, a bit unplanned, and I decided that the most logical thing was gonna be to go home. So when I moved to Swaziland and my sister moved to France, my mom thought that three continents, three people, three time zones was probably a bit much. So she took her list of criteria again and tried to find one of the countries that would fit all of them, but in Europe this time, in order to be near to Brussels and my sister. She found a place, Madrid, Spain. I had never been, I was quite happy. So it was a new experience and I was happy to go home once again. Except that when I got there, I had to get used to different parts of me being brought up out again. I was introduced to everybody as my mother's daughter. That had not happened to me in two years. And then when it was people who heard a bit about our family history and being scattered around the world, I was Caroline's daughter, you know the one who went to a boarding school up a hill in Swaziland. It's a bit longer, but still, my story and what I had been through became part of my identity and defined me in the eyes of other people. The other tricky part that I had to deal with was the fact that I wasn't a student anymore and I wasn't a student yet. So I was in that weird in between where I didn't really know what I was doing and what my identity was. So when people asked me, what are you doing? I didn't really have an answer. But somehow I managed and I survived living with my mother again after two years of being alone. So that was positive. And then I came here. I remember arriving here and on my third day we had registration and we had to go through the heirloom house where I got handed in a list of all the societies that we had on campus and I got asked, which one would interest you? And at that point, if you look at the map and you've seen how I've turned around, I told the girl that I was interested in the Latin American society, the French connection, the Spanish society, the Italian society, the African Caribbean society, and the European society. So sh she looked at me a bit, a bit confused and smiled. I was a bit scared because I didn't know how she was going to react. She asked me why I was interested, and I know the drill. 30 seconds. You can summarize your, your whole story, and then after that, either they smile and they're interested and you can go on, or they just look at you and you might as well just change the topic and talk about the weather because that's going to be the safest bet. So in that case, she was smiling, so it was positive, and she just nicely told me, you know, I think you have an amazing life experience and all these societies will help you foster all these little parts of you. And at that point, I felt like I had found a place where I belonged. So through all the moves, the ups, the downs, the cultures, the people, I have learned a lot of things about myself, but about what identity is in general. About myself, I have learned that I am an observer. I will observe a lot of people around me, and not in a creepy way, just because I am used to observing and replicating what I see in order to survive in a new environment. I also know that I am used to saying goodbye 
So sometimes I'm harsh in my friendships and I don't always see everything around me because I just want to enjoy it as much as I can because time is limited. I also know that I am a weird mix, but I've accepted it. My identity is, it's special, but I like it. And in general, identity is like little pieces of Legos that fit together. And at one point, your identity might be a tower, but in another context or in a couple of years, it can be a full-on castle, and it's beautiful, and we should all embrace all the parts that make us who we are. Thank you very much.